Well, again, God's grace and peace to you. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, again, I want to just thank you for allowing me uh, to be here. And um, with, with the change, of course, initially, uh, Pastor Dan was going to preach. And so uh, he has his text and, and sermon title uh, in the bulletin. But we're going to deviate from that. I hope that's okay. And uh, the text we're going to be taking a look at today comes from uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 21. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. I imagine you guys have NAVs, don't you? In your... I'll go ahead and read out the NIV instead of the ESV. Um, so again, Luke, chapter 21, beginning with verse 25. Before we read God's word, um, would you pray with me? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which comes to us living and active. Father, we thank you for your word, which sometimes comes as a double-edged sword, again, piercing the soul. So, Father, we just pray that as we open your word today, Lord, that you, you would use it to touch each and every single one of the people that are here today, Lord, at where they are at in their life. Because, Father, if, if your word can't be applied to our daily lives, then what good is it? But Heavenly Father, we know that it does, and it, and it touches us, it messes with us, it, it challenges us, it comforts us. And so we just pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that he would descend upon this place, Lord, and again, you would meet each and every person, Lord, exactly where they need to be met this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 25. Now Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and we'll get a little bit of the, the, the context of what this is being, where, where Jesus is speaking this. But beginning with verse 25, he says, Now there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehension of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. And when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. You know, when Luke uh, wrote this text, well, today's, today's message is going to focus on actually just a couple areas, uh, two areas. Um, the first thing is this, listen, when tragedy strikes, when it, when it seems as though your world is shaken to its core, we as believers, we have a unique response to this. We as believers get to react in a way that the world cannot, and the world does not. And when we do, the world takes notice. When tragedy strikes, when our world is shaken to its core, we have a response that is unique. And that response is we get to stand up straight and lift up our heads because our redemption is near. So that's the first point, the first emphasis. And the second part is this. How, can we get, how come we can do that? And the reason why we could do that is all because of the cross. It's because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's because of his example that when his world was being rocked, when his world was being shaken, he was able to lift up his head, and he did so in many, many different ways because he knew his redemption was near. And we can do so because of what God has done for us in the cross, his grace and his redemption that he has wrought for us on the cross. And so those are the two areas that we're going to be looking at. Now, I just want to, again, want to take a look at this context here, because when Luke is writing this text, right, this is probably 30, 35 years after Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, okay? So the early church has been moving around on the earth here for 30, 35 years, and we've seen a lot of really neat stuff happening. Of course, there was Pentecost, right? Boom, where the Holy Spirit comes with power and with might, and, be, and, and the disciples begin to preach, and to share that, that initial word of God, that initial gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see the Spirit moves powerfully, right? 5,000 people saved on that one day. And so, but since then, a lot of other neat things 
leaders have risen up in the church. Of course, Paul, one of those primary leaders, but many, many others. Philip, Lydia, Barnabas, right? That great encourager. Uh, Priscilla, Silas, and Timothy. All of these guys, hundreds of others as well have been sharing the message of Jesus Christ around the known world at that time. At the time of this writing, when, when Luke is writing this, uh, the Apostle Paul has already been arrested and is sitting in Rome, uh, awaiting his trial, and we know uh, his, his execution is coming as well. Um, and again, that's come because of, of Paul's willingness to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Christ. The Apostle Peter, he, he's been busy. He's been going around, and what's crazy is the Apostle Peter, he's been traveling all over the Middle East, and he actually doesn't come back into Jerusalem, into Galilee, into that region. Uh, he's been out spreading the gospel, just like Jesus asked him to do. And so the church of Jesus Christ is growing uh, exponentially during this time, and not only in the Jewish community, but also in the Gentile community. And that's a good thing for us sitting here today, right? Because I imagine we're all Gentiles. I could be wrong. There might be somebody here of Jewish descent. And if so, praise God. Um, but my guess is probably most of us would fall into that Gentile category. And so thanks be to God, right? That, that God was saying, listen, Jewish people, I'm working through you to be a blessing to the nations. And we're a part of those nations, right? And, uh, and, uh, man, and we don't have to become culturally Jewish in order to be followers of Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful thing, right? Amen? I love bacon way too much. That'd be hard. It'd have to be socially. Okay, I got, thanks, Kim. She, said, she did tell me she was going to support me today. I didn't know it was going to be you know, the one laugh. But that's good. Okay. So, um, and so again, the, 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 the church of Jesus Christ is going, growing. Um, today's gospel reading, though, is an interesting segment. Uh, it's it's Jesus' kind of end-time discourse uh, going on in, in the gospel of Luke. And what promoted, what prompted this question was Jesus and his disciples were coming out of, of the temple, which was absolutely gorgeous, right? I mean, beautiful. And the disciples say, oh man, Jesus... Look at this temple. Look at how beautiful it is. Look at these stones. My goodness, they are massive. They are huge. And the implication is, listen, Jesus, this is, this is permanence, right? And this is here forever. And Jesus is like, no, no. I mean, there will come a day, listen, when none of these stones, not a single one of these stones will be left standing. This entire thing is going to be destroyed. Of course, the disciples are taken back a little bit, right? Because the temple, I mean, that's, that is their connection with God. That is what sets them apart as God's chosen people was the temple worship. And wait a minute, Jesus, you're saying this, this is going to be totally destroyed. And Jesus says, yes, it will. And then he goes into his end time discourse. And sometimes he, he oscillates between 70 AD, when we know that the temple was destroyed by, by the Romans, so he oscillates between that time as well as his second coming, right? His second coming as the Son of Man. And, and, and just using that title, you know, the disciples, uh, Jewish people, they're, they're going to have flashbacks uh, to the apocalyptic language of the Old Testament that the Old, Pro Old Testament prophets used. And probably one of the most, most well-known ones comes from the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter, right? where Daniel says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations, right? Not just one nation, but all peoples, all nations, all languages should serve and worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Listen, Jesus is saying, you're looking for this to be your permanence, but this is not your permanence, right? I have come to establish a kingdom, and it is in that kingdom that you find permanence. So listen, 
when your world is being shaken, when your world is being rocked to its core, when you see these things happening, not only nationally in Jerusalem, but when you see these things happening in your own personal lives, when something hits you so hard that you think, how can I, how can I get through this, Lord? How, how can I do this? Jesus says we have a response to that as people of God. We can stand firm. We can lift our heads because we know our redemption is near. Our redemption is in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, through Luke, right, was telling his people, right, the Jewish nation as well as the, Jew, uh, the Gentile believers to hang on, hang on. Because not only is the Jewish world going to be rocked and shaken, but really, quite honestly, not long after, the entire Roman Empire was rocked and was shaken. Right? But in the midst of this, God gives us this hope, this amazing message of hope that comes through the recorded words of Luke. And listen, Luke is a believer, right? Luke's a believer. And so he, he's, he believes the Lord God always has a message of hope for us. And again, it's a message that twofold. That listen, we can straighten up, we can stand firm, and we can raise our heads. And so Jesus can make such a bold challenge to his disciples back then. Jesus can make such a bold challenge to us today because of the example that he lived out on the cross. The example that Jesus Christ lived out on the cross. Jesus is not willing to ask us to do anything that he has not already done first. Right? He's not willing to ask us to do anything that he has not already done first. He is not willing to ask, he's not willing to ask us to do anything that he will not walk with us through. Jesus' world was shaken, was rocked to the core. Right? The greatest injustice, the greatest tragedy that humanity has ever experienced was the cross. When the one through whom the entire world was created came to that world, to that creation, and was rejected by it. To the one who established a people, a people who would be his people, and he would love them like a groom loves his bride. And that people rejected him time and time again, that people placed him on a cross. Jesus knows what it's like to experience tragedy. Jesus knows what it's like to experience injustice. But in the face of that, Jesus could stand up and he could lift his head because he knew his redemption was near. And so from the cross, Jesus could, could whisper words of forgiveness for those people who placed him there, right? From the cross, Jesus could whisper words of encouragement to those who were dying right alongside of him. In the midst of that pain and suffering, Jesus could speak words of hope. And we, as his people, have the privilege and the honor to be able to do the same thing. In tragedy and in justice, we get to stand firm. We get to lift our heads and we get to speak words of hope into those situations. Right. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of this. Listen, when all this is going on, he says, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Right? And so we as believers in Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, we must at all times hold both of these truths in our hands. We hold the cross, and it's injustice and it's in tragedy, but we also hold the cross with its blessings, because out of the greatest injustice came the greatest blessing God has ever brought to humanity as well. Because it's in the cross we find forgiveness of sins. And it's in the forgiveness of sins that we find salvation. And so we can be bought back to live out the lives that God wanted us to live. To live lives that love Him and that serve Him. And this is the message that we have, right? For the world, for our communities, for our families, and for ourselves. 
How do we have hope? How can we share the message of hope when our world is shaken to the core? And so again, Jesus wants us to straighten up, right? He doesn't want us to sit down. He doesn't want us to hide. He doesn't want us to compromise. He doesn't want us to be quiet. Jesus wants us to stand firm, right? To straighten up, to be spirit-filled, trusting, not defeated witnesses during troubled times, right? In fact, we live in a world, right, that's going through unsettled times. But listen, in times of uncertainty, we are to be voices of certainty, right? In times of doubt, we are to be voices of clarity and of faith. In fearful times, we are to be the the calming and the reassuring voices. In times of confusion, we are to be the voices of conviction. That's who we are as a people of God. We can straighten up. We can raise our heads. You know, people in the world, they're, they're looking down. They're looking backwards or they're not looking at all, right? We see this around us all the time in people. Again, they're looking down. They have no hope for the future, and so they just look down. Or they're looking backwards, right? Remember the glory days, right? Remember when our country was like this. Remember when our community was like this. Remember, and so, or they're looking backwards or they're just not looking at all. But we as the people of God, we have a response that's unique. We get to look up because our redemption is near. We who are in Christ are to have our heads lifted high. The Apostle Paul, he understood this, right? In Colossians 3, he writes this. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ, right? But sometimes that's a lot harder to do when your world is falling apart, right? When a loved one has has died, And you're dealing with that pain. You're dealing with that sorrow. Or the doctor has walked into the the office and he says, I'm sorry, but the results of the test were positive. Yes, it's cancer. And now you have to live with that. Or you're in a relationship that just doesn't seem like it's going to work out. And that things are falling apart. Listen, we all experience those things. Every single one of us experiences those things. But we have a response that is unique to the world. We get to lift our heads. We get to straighten up because our redemption is near. You know, and in 17 years of ministry, I've seen this replay itself over and over and over and over again in the lives of God's people. And I'm sure every single one of you would have, could have stories. I and mean, we could spend the rest of the time just telling stirring stories, which would be great because testimonies are a wonderful thing. Because testimonies tell us where where the word of God really hits the the road, right? Where the rubber hits the road. How we've experienced these things in life, and I've seen it in the lives of people who have experienced tremendous loss in their lives. The loss of a loved one. And yet in the midst of that, they can lift it. In the midst of that, they can lift their heads, right? And God can use them in wonderful, powerful ways. I've seen that. I've seen uh, relationships that, that it's over, it's over. You know, the, the divorce, that word comes out. And yet they lift, they straighten up and they lift their heads. And God, they allow God to mess with them and work with them. And the marriage is saved. Not only is it saved, but it's stronger than it ever has been. I've seen, I've seen people, again, you know, coming to the funeral of loved ones. And they said, listen, this is, this is a rejoicing ceremony in the life of this person. Because we know that their time here on earth, yes, is over. But now they're living for eternity. And so we can rejoice. We as a people, God, we can do that, right? That's who we are. You know, uh, the community of Platt was rocked by a tragedy. And again, uh, it was an unfathomable, it was an unthinkable tragedy something we, we never ever would have, we never ever could have even believed could have happened in Platte, South Dakota, right? I mean, you guys, same thing for you. I mean, we live in these small town communities and you know, these things happen elsewhere, right? They happen elsewhere. And uh, 
that Thursday morning when we, got, when we first got the news, you know, and it was just, that time it was just the loss of a family in this tragic fire. You know, the community of Platt, we, we responded by again standing up, lifting our heads, leaning in on our faith, and, and going to churches and having prayer meetings and, and, and again seeking God in all of that. And then that following Monday, we find out exactly what happened. And now again, having, having to live through that all over again. And again, we leaned in on our faith. You know, and, and, and we hoped beyond all hope that the words of God could be true. You know, when he said, in all things, God can bring about good. But there's a couple qualifiers on that. In all things, God can bring about good for those who love him and live according to his purpose. Right? And so the Ministerial Association of Platt was faced with this, this challenge. Do we truly believe this, right? Or do we as a people of God, do we as, as, as ministers in our community, is this just something that we say as just a nice little platitude to people when they're going through a hard time? Oh, God can bring about good in all things. Or do we really mean it? Do we believe it? And so we had to step out in faith. And there was a ton and ton of prayer. Lord, because we want to do this first and foremost, Lord, because we love you, yes. But we want to be, this to be done according to your purposes. According to your purposes. And God moved mightily. And, and he did a lot of amazing things uh, to make the entire New Hope thing happen. You know, and, and so New Hope has a very, very unique story about God's redemption and about God's grace. But listen, so do you, right? Each one of you has a unique story about God's redemption and God's grace. And if New Hope's story needs to be told, that's true. But your story needs to be told as well. Your story needs to be told. Because I know this, listen, if God can redeem me, he can redeem anything. He can redeem anyone. And so that's the message of redemption that we have. You know, it's, it's the mention of redemption uh, that Paul mentions in that, in, that, in that great chapter of Romans, right? Romans chapter 3. How often do we go there, right? Romans chapter 3, uh, beginning with verse 19. He says, now, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous, righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, it's through the law that we become aware of sin. But, oh, right? Anytime you see that word, but, in Scripture, your ears should perk up, perk up if you're listening to it, or your eyes should get wider, because something good's coming, Right? Okay, this is true. This is who we are under the law. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace through the redemption. Right? There's that word again. God's redeeming power through Jesus Christ. Through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. For it is God who presented him as that atoning sacrifice for our sin. And so that's the message that we want to proclaim at New Hope. That, that's my goal. My goal is that every single child, every single family in the state of South Dakota has the opportunity to hear that story of redemption in Jesus Christ. That's what we want to see happen at New Hope Christian Camp and Retreat Center. And, uh, you know, and it's true with all ministries, we, we rely on the people of God to be able to do that, right? Um, we, got, we got some summer programming that's going on this summer. First time we're going to be doing our own summer programming. And we as a board, we wanted to make this commitment. Listen, we want to make this as reasonable in cost for, for, for kids because we want kids to be able to come regardless of the cost of camp. And so it is. I mean, compared to other camps, $150 for a week. Most other camps are three dollars to $400. 
But again, we can only do that because of the generous support of God's people. Right? So every kid, every kid has the opportunity to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Um, I want to show you just real quickly just some of the facilities that are available because some of you haven't been there. But I do want to tell you this. Listen, and you can go ahead and start that. Uh, listen, if you ever want to come out and see the facilities, uh, give me a call. Give Ivory a call. Give Kim a call. I'm sure we'll be able to arrange it. But one of the, one of the neat areas is, is kind of the lounge. It's become really just kind of a really neat, just kind of social place. There, in the upstairs, there's a full-size kitchen as well that's available for, for uh, groups that come in and want to do things. Uh, a dining hall, we put 40 kids in there. And so it, it seats quite a few people in the upstairs. Um, there's also meeting room areas. And I believe this was from the Lighthouse, did a women's retreat there. And uh, they were the ones that put all the flowers around, <laughs> which was kind of nice. But anyway, um, there are four bunk rooms upstairs, which can sleep up to 40 people. There's 20 bunk beds, 40 beds total. Each of those rooms has its own bathroom uh, with shower facilities in it as well. And so that makes it kind of nice. Um, we also have a large gymnasium, a full-size gymnasium uh, in the main floor. Um, which is used for a variety of different things, right? And playing games, all kinds of games. And of course, we have other equipment outside for in the playground for both kids, both old and young, uh, can play on that. And uh, it's actually, that's an old picture. We should get a newer one. But a lot of other things, uh, opportunities for kids just to, to play and enjoy themselves, sand volleyball. You know, uh, Gaga ball, ever heard of that yet? Okay, that's, that's kind of a new thing. But actually, the kids will line up to play that for, forever. And uh, it's just really kind of a fun thing. You know, when we were going around initially, uh, Pastor Joel and I, um, it kind of came at kind of a hashtag of mine. I said, we believe that God can redeem this place and it can once again become a place where kids can come, laugh and play, have a good time. But more importantly, Hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in him. And God is making that happen. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a joy to be able to see that go on. We've hosted uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship has come in the last two summers and did their, our first five-day overnight camps. And uh, again, so to be able to be there and see kids laugh and play and have a good time and stuff like that. And I know they heard the gospel proclaimed because they asked if I'd be willing to do the Bible studies. So I'm like, yes, okay, so I can do that. And so they heard every single day the gospel message of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in him. And, uh, you know, I just want to leave you with this, this last thing. Why, why camping? You know, why, why should we support summer camp? And I know you guys have, uh, have camps that you do support already. Probably, I mean, Inspiration Hills, I know, is uh, with the RCA and, and other things. But, you know, here's another opportunity, a camp, camp that's close to home, and the, the impact that camping has on the lives of, of children is just amazing. And this is, these are six points, and there's a lot of other ones, but six points from uh, an article that I read recently. Um, first of all, it's just this opportunity to be able to connect with and reach out to others. And it not only includes, you know, kids of their own age, but it also includes the adult counselors, you know, the college age and high school kids that are there as counselors and counselors in training, to be able to connect with them, even if it means burying your friend in the sand, right? That's connecting. Um, they found that kids they, that attend camp have just a greater overall happiness, right? And I, I, and I can't help but believe it's because of that joy that we have in Jesus Christ. And so that comes out, that manifests itself in camping. That's uh, actually the last two sides, Pastor Joel Davis's kids. Um, but, but there's also an impact on kids with regards to church. And I want you to know that we as a camp, we, are, we want to come alongside and partner with you as a church. Because it increases interest, children's interest in worship services. And they come back and they want to be more involved with you because you're their church. New Hope is not their church. Um, also increased in uh, devotional practices, personal devotions. Uh, they find that that happens as they go to camp. And again, I think a lot of that has to see because they see the example of, of young adults and their devotion as well. And again, something that's very important for church is just a greater engagement in church. 
as they come back into your own congregations on fire for Jesus, and, and they just they want to live out that faith in a more practical way. And so we find that in their life involvement with the church as well. And of course, something that we want to see happen in kids, in church, anywhere they are, of course, is just a greater assurance in their faith, in their personal faith. But you know what? This, this God thing that I'm hearing in, in church and in Sunday school, you know, this is real. This is real stuff. And it can really be lived out in my daily life. And so they grow in assurance with that as well. And so I just want to thank you uh, as a congregation because I know you have been very, very supportive of New Hope and, and I want to thank you for that as well. Um, following the service, I'm going to be standing out there in the narthex and uh, if you have any other further questions, I, I invite you, please come and, and talk to me and ask me about it. Uh, we do have a couple of events coming up. Uh, we have a men's retreat that is actually this coming Friday through Sunday, and we still have spots available. And so I do have some uh, uh, registration forms for that. Uh, th there's a few guys speaking that you might know. Well, for sure one of them, Pastor Dan Evans. So not the graph, but Evans. Evans, not Don either. So anyway, uh, Pastor Dan Evans, he's going to be speaking. Uh, Pastor Gus Craven. He does Native American ministry in Wombly, South Dakota. He's going to be there. And then our worship leader is a gentleman by the name of Tim, Tim Collins. And so that's coming up this weekend, um, but also the, a women's gathering, February 8th through 9th. And so the, we have brochures for that as well. And if you want more information, I'm sure you can talk to Ivory, and she'll talk your, your ear off with that. Um, also have uh, applications for, for summer programming. And so if you have a child anywhere from uh, first grade up to eighth grade, um, I'd encourage you to just pick one of them up, prayerfully consider uh, whether or not you would like to send uh, your child to camp. We've got brochures for that as well. And then also, if you know of any high school or college age student that is looking not just for a job this summer, but for a calling. Not just a job, but a calling. Um, I do have applications for our summer staff. Um, we will be hiring four college-age uh, students to be counselors. And so there will be a, a college-age student as a counselor in every single cabin. And then also four uh, high school-age students uh, to be counselors in training. And so they will be in the cabins as well with each of those counselors. And then, and then three or four other high school or college age students that just want to be on support staff and help in the kitchen, help with maintenance, help with uh, janitorial stuff. And uh, so those, op and, and that's all explained inside of the, the, the bullet or the pamphlet as well. So if you know of anybody that thinks, if you don't, if you know of any, any kid you want to get out of your house for the summer, just come pick up one of these things, right? But anyway, well, would you pray with me? Well, Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we just give you thanks and praise for, for who you are and for what you have done for us in the cross of Jesus Christ, how you have redeemed us. And because of that redemption, Lord, we can stand tall and we can lift up our heads no matter what's going on around us. Father, we trust in your words that you can do good in all things for those who love you and live according to his purposes. And so, Father, we just thank you for that as well. So, Father, I just pray now that, that, that this word, your word that was spoken today, Father, might truly be your words. And if there's anything I said, Lord God, that needs to be stricken from the, from the record, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would do it. But again, we lean in and we trust in your Holy Spirit that even though my speaking comes from, from a very, very fallible human being, Lord, that your spirit can take that word and can touch uh, the hearts and the lives of people where they're at. And so we thank you for that, Lord God, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.